Hello, this is Lauren Kingsland. I'm at the McLean Textile Gallery today with Malka Kutnik. Malka is a fiber artist who does completely amazing things with um, denim and other fairly heavy fabric. She kind of pushes the edge of what we have been offering here at the McLean Textile Gallery. People all morning have been walking in as she installed the show going, wow! So I want to hear about the wow. How do you do this, Malika? Well, Ta thank you so much. Well, um, um, I come from a painting background and I have sculptural ideas. And so I wanted to combine the two and it moved to fabric. And um, all the fabric is donated by friends and family. And I feel like I'm helping the environment by not purchasing any material and it saves me a little money uh, which is and, always and good it, and it keeps the jeans out of the landfill absolutely you know? absolutely yeah. and so i i even love it when people give me jeans that are holy not that the kind that they that they buy holy in the first place but that they w don't want to wear because they're holy yeah. or they don't fit or whatever so um so in this piece um i took only the tops. Uh -huh. of it's very clear when you look at this, what this used to be. That's right. Very clear. <laughs> That's right. What's I, the I, title of this? This is called curling. Curling. And so I put, I sewed all these tops together. I used an industrial sewing machine. Uh -huh. And um, then I was like, what am I going to do? So then I, I work a lot with process and on the floor. And like, oh, what, do, what happens if I move it like this? What happens if I move it like that? And then it came to me when I put it on the wall that this is like a spine, but it could be reminiscent of an animal or a sea creature. Mm -hmm. um, Very organic. And yeah. then I needed this to curl yeah. at the end once it was up on the wall. It changes all the time till I get it up on the wall, and then it changes some more. So gravity is also part of Absolutely. part of your art. Absolutely. That makes sense as a dancer too. Yes. You know, as a dancer you are in conversation with gravity all the time. Absolutely. So there's this movement and a curling. Uh huh. Just lovely. Now, I noticed that you got a lot of little excuse me for touching the art, but you got a little a lot of little threadies hanging off. Right. So what's that all about? The threads the threads are not placed there. The threads are part of my process. I leave the threads and then I they act, they act in a visual way. So they show the process and they also add quite a bit to the piece. They do, they add a, a, a little detail and you never have to clip threads. How fabulous. That's right. Well, those of us who have little boxes to put threads in at the sewing machine, I have to re-examine our process. Exactly. <laughs> That's great. That is wonderful. Let's move down to see some of the other things on sure. this wall. We'll pass this one by and we'll come back and talk about it at the, okay. at the end. Great. Okay. Great. So, if you want to stand here. So, here we have something that's got this amazing gold fringe on it. What's going on here? Well, so I take the materials that people have given me, uh -huh. and this, this gold fringe came on a roll, um, but also people gave me a remnants of, of upholstery materials, right. which have some strength to them. Right. And I pleat a lot of my, uh, I really do a lot of pleating because that gives it more strength and structure. Right. And sometimes I cut through the pleats oh, yes. for that. a visual right. effect. So then you would have two layers there so, so that you could see there's what's underneath. two layers and sometimes there's other cloth underneath mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. shows through. Yeah. And um, then sometimes I cut in different ways mm -hmm. so that I feel like it adds another dimension this to uh, the a texture. A lot, lot of texture there. It looks yes. almost like a crown. Right, and the texture, <laughs> the texture sometimes reminds me of organic um, mm -hmm. items like grass, yeah. um, 
what you can find in the nature right. and it transforms the material yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I do push the material and I push the way that it makes a form on the wall and so this fringe I added at the end and puffs out uh -huh. there's nothing holding it there it just happens because of the way I sewed it and and the way I puffed it out and it forms this kind of a yeah. shape amazing amazing I have I, I think um, one characteristic of a successful piece of art is that the viewer is in conversation with it and there are just all kinds of little stories here that I can imagine um, so they're they're very talkative your, your pieces yes. are very talkative on their own. I, I um, have, sometimes I have intentions as to right. why I put things where I put things, but I, I would like the viewer to use their own imagination. So they're adding to the piece. Right. It's, right. it's a conversation. Of, I make the piece and I have my own conversation. Then the viewer had, brings something else entirely. Right. And each viewer brings something different. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Let's go back and talk about this piece uh, that we was right where we first started. Sure. You t said that this is your current most current piece. Yes, this is my most current piece, and I was given very many materials. Yes. Um. So I have, I actually have a lot to say about every little process that I went through, um, but I prefer that the viewer make up their own idea. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I will say it does have some influence of human form. Okay. Uh, wow. And um, so I will say that. All right, and it looks like you've incorporated a found woven you know, piece, belt. like a strap or a belt or something with, yes. with um, it was made out of embroidery floss, clearly, because exactly. there it is as the that's right the fringe at the end of it. That's right. Um, I, I haven't seen that in, in the other pieces, but it's in, you know it's interesting. You've you've incorporated what came to hand, right? Right. right. Fabulous. Fabulous. Um, so now, just in uh, to sort of sum up, tell me what you're wearing. Oh, <laughs> this is a piece I made just recently for me to wear for you, you today. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can see the back. Uh -huh. Like a little rough. And I just put it right on and I felt like these were shoulders. Yes. Like on my shoulders. On your shoulders. Yes. And I added the beads. Lovely. They're sewn on. Lovely. Well, uh, what a treat it has been to meet you and talk to you. And hear all about your um, your process. And I'm sorry we don't have about an hour to talk about the, your uh, early development and your painting and your work in canvas and you know, all of the, the steps that got you to these pieces. But I hope that uh, visitors to the McLean Textile Gallery will be astonished and delighted by this fresh way of looking at material which happens to have been repurposed and is wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. What a treat. What a treat. <laughs> You're so welcome. <laughs> Hello, I'm Lauren Kingsland. Uh, today I'm at the McLean Textile Gallery with Alicia Thomas looking at an exhibit of quilts from the historic quilt collection at the Virginia Quilt Museum. Alicia is the director there. Welcome. We're so happy that you Thank shared you. part of the collection with us. Thank you. And Alicia has picked out quilts from the exhibit that are the same, only different. In, and they're different by um, because they're in different scales. So we're going to see several different ways that quilts are made. And the quilt makers had a choice. These are traditional patterns. Mm -hmm. But even when you're working, especially when you're working with traditional patterns, you see the hand of the maker 
or the mind of the maker in her dis choices of colors she picks, fabric she picks, and the scale she picks. How big is her piece going to be? How big are all the component little elements of it going to be? And what happens when you change this, the size of the whole piece? What happens when you change the size of the little individual units in the piece? What a cool idea Thank for you. looking at quilts in a fresh way, looking at historic quilts in a fresh way. Yeah. Tell us about these two pieces. These two pieces here were actually made by the same yeah. person. So they were made by Emma Rebecca Curlin Miller. Um, and we think they were made in the later half of the 1800s. So 1870, 1880, 1890. We don't have a specific date, but they are the same pattern. So they're the same block pattern. They're both ocean waves. This one is a full size and then the other one is a crib quilt. And they're made using some of the same fabrics, but they look very different, not only in scale, but they have different borders and the quilting on them is done differently. So on this large one in the white blocks, there is a feathered wreath pattern done. Whereas in the crib quilt, it's just done in straight lines. It's much simpler. Much simpler. Much and you can imagine someone that's making two of these knowing that a crib quilt is just going to be used and used and used and right. maybe not last as long. This one remarkably lasts really well. It's in really good condition for a crib quilt. Right. It's something we see with crib quilts and doll quilts and things made for children is they don't last very long because they're so loved and used that they right. can just disintegrate. And longer. And longer, <laughs> and longer, yeah. Right. So you can see there's different borders on these. The one thing I found really fascinating looking at it on the crib quilt, these center squares, the little pinwheels, they're all exactly the same on the crib quilt, but they're not on the larger version. How about that? Yeah, and so it's just, did they have enough fabric to make it that way on the crib quilt? Or, you know, was that a choice or was it just what they fabric they ran out of? Right. How interesting. That is an embroidery style known as red work. This is a very common kind of pastime textile. Yeah. What you say? Yeah. And red work was often used to teach embroidery and sewing to small children, specifically girls, um, because it is like you don't have to make color choices. It's all just in red. <laughs> um, and it was commonly red because that was one of the first really color fast dyes and threads they had okay. was the turkey red. The turkey red. Okay. Um, that's, that's so this one is a doll quilt. Again, we don't have a specific date, but we think 1900 to 1920. Red work really took off after the centennial. So in 1876, that's when red work kind of took oh, off, interesting, um, interesting. but was hugely popular through the 1930s. So it was a trend that lasted a long time. You mentioned that you thought a child might have done this. Do you think she drew her own drawings or did she get them from other places? Or what, uh, what was common? Maybe a little of both. So you could buy patterns for like a penny a block. Okay. Um, you could also get free patterns from thread companies, they would put them out, or uh -huh. uh, ladies magazines would include free patterns, because one of the things with red work is it's always just an outline. It's not... Just a line drawn. Yeah, yeah there's no shading, there's no filling in. Um, right. And you can, if you look really closely at this one, you can see some are done a little bit better, so maybe like <laughs> she started with that block, but then, you know, as she progressed right. as into she more... As learned something. Yeah. yeah. And there's a couple of blocks that repeat. This little dog repeats oh, a couple yes, of times. There he is. Um, Interesting. And you can tell this is a doll quilt that was well loved and well used. Absolutely. It's a little stained. There's some tears. Yeah, but. A little. And you know, it has history. Mm -hmm. It has. How great is that? Yeah. Yeah. And you can just imagine. Yeah. So tell me the story of this one. So this quilt was made, we actually know when this one was made. It was made in 1858, and it was made by an eight or nine year old little girl named Henrietta Lou Jarman. And this was a quilt that she made under the supervision of her older sister, who was teaching her how to sew and quilt. And the family lore has it that many tears were shed over this quilt and many <laughs> seams ripped out as she was learning how to quilt and how to sew straight seams. Well, her intersections are lovely. Yes. They are lovely. She may have cried, but she learned. 
And her, her quilting is very good for such yes. a small child. She's got very even small stitches. Even small stitches and... And we call this one Aunt Edda's Nine of Diamonds because it's the nine patch, but then the quilting in the rectangular block or in the yes. triangle blocks is done in diamond shapes. Uh-huh. And um, Aunt Edda was Henrietta, the oh, right. child that made it. It was donated by one of her family members a few. Nice. So this quilt is in extremely good condition. Yeah, so my guess with this one is it wasn't used much. Mm -hmm. There's no staining, there's no fading. It's held up really well. One of the things you see with older quilts once they've been used a lot is they stop being perfectly square. Right, because they've stretched. They've stretched, they've been washed, they've been you know right. pulled up in the bed. Um, Somebody's jumped on the bed. Yeah, <laughs> all sorts of things. Things happen. <laughs> things happen. So that this one is still so vibrant and still yeah. so square, it probably wasn't used all that much, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, lucky us that we get to see it. Yeah. And so the choices were made in both cases. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, Henrietta had a lot of this navy blue fabric because it's she's got a variety of fabrics in yeah, the Yeah, and in she the clearly patches. liked moons. There's moons here and a little bit of a okay, moon there and there. Right. And there. Right. So, um, yeah. But this looks like it was new fabric. The, the fabric is all in similar condition. It's new or, yeah, or, new, or, or not or all purchased around the same time. Right. If they were a large family, or possibly scraps from scraps, clothing. Lots of clothing. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's just um, it's lovely. Here we have a small version of a trip around the world quilt. So it's only one square, right? It's yep. It, everything's done in squares except for the border, which is done in strips. So these probably started out as inch and a half squares that finished to inch. Uh -huh. So that's really small. Uh -huh. And one of the things you can, when you look at this thing as a whole quilt, you can see all of the choices they made in their color fabrics. Um, and there's at least 23 different fabrics in this one. Uh -huh. And then also a different, there's a paler yellow backing. So it's clearly a lot of careful thought went mm -hmm. into planning this because all of the squares are the same. The only way you get a pattern is by the placement of color. Mm -hmm. Well, it's... Yeah. And the uh, quilt this size would have been a crib quilt? This would have been a crib, crib quilt, quilt, most mm -hmm. likely. So again, this one maybe wasn't used all that much uh -huh. or was just taken care of really well. Yeah. Um, this yeah. one we think also was made about 1940s, so the 1940s, 1950s okay. maybe. Okay. Um, so just a little bit more color fast fabrics and also just not quite as old as some of the right. other ones we've looked at. That's true. Um, and we have another trip around the world. Yes. So this one is very colorful and it has over 40 fabrics in it, I believe. 40 fabrics in it. Um, and it's set on point, so it, another design choice. Yeah, so this one you know, forms rectangles, whereas the smaller one formed diamonds. Right, right. This one is also fun because it's what we call a time span quilt. Oh, what's that? So they were really made kind of famous by Becky Hurdle in the 1980s and 1990s, and she actually wrote a whole book about them. It's out of print, but you can find cheap copies on Amazon or eBay for Thank goodness. $5. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so she would go around to estate sales and auctions and buy unfinished quilt tops. Yes. And then she would finish them. Yes. So this quilt top was made by a woman named Ruth Hall, and we're not sure exactly when. Guess from the fabrics is probably the 1930s. And then Becky bought it sometime in the 1980s and finished it in 1998. Okay. And so okay. she even has some that the quilt tops are from the 1800s that then she finished. Then she finished. And so she tried to keep them as whole as possible. Uh -huh. So this one, the only thing she did is she squared off the edges. Um, by like, putting a wide black border on it. So there actually was black. She added um, another set of triangles to okay. make it an okay. even border. And then she backed it and hand quilted it. What an interesting addition to the story. Yeah. yeah so. And we have about 70 of Becky's time span quilts. Really? Yeah. So wow. oh, that's well. And they're very fun because they 
They cover all designs and all ages of quilts. And she tried to finish them how she thought the original maker would have finished them. So she hand quilted a lot of them. Because I mean, you're, 1980s and 1990s machine quilting still wasn't very popular right. or really accepted by a lot of the quilting community. So. Right, right. And the machines were not yeah. up to it. You know, the, mm -hmm. the long arm machines we have today were just not present yeah. in 1980. Mm -hmm. So the, you mentioned that you have a lot of them. Uh, so I, we need to circle back yes. to <laughs> the, the fact that you are, in fact, the director of the Virginia Quilt Museum. So you have a place with Lots more quilts yes. if people, people get a nice taste of Virginia Quilt Museum here. Yeah. Um, you know, thank you for the um, McLean Textile Gallery for being a, a little outreach site of the museum. Yeah. And so tell us about the museum. So the museum's physical location is in Harrisonburg, Virginia, so over in the Shenandoah Valley. We are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4, and we have three floors of gallery spaces there. So we always have some quilts from our permanent collection on display. Our collection at the Virginia Quilt Museum is about 400 quilts now. Um, the oldest is from 1806, the newest is from 2017. So we collect quilts of all kinds and of all ages. We focus our collecting by collecting quilts that are related to Virginia. Okay. Um, so that's our main requirement. And But then along with our quilts, we also do have traveling exhibits, so from modern uh, fiber artists and quilters. Um, right now we have a great exhibit by a woman named Josephine Millat, who's a local quilter in the Shenandoah Valley. So we have some of her award-winning quilts. We have uh, Mary Beth Bella's uh, kind of art quilt exhibit right now. We'll soon have another art quilt exhibit by Sue Reno. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have, through mid-September, an exhibit we're calling Handsomely Hand Done which has some of our older hand quilted pieces. So those are a lot from the mid to early 1800s that feature really intricate quilting in them. So. Thank you so much for sharing your work, your, oh. your collection with us here at the McLean Textile Gallery. We are thrilled to have it here and for people to be able to come see it without having to come all the way to Harrisonburg. Harrisonburg is a hike. Yeah, but it's also a wonderful weekend destination <laughs> if anyone needs a little getaway from DC for the weekend. Okay, huh. okay. Alicia, thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you. It's been just delightful to walk through with you. Yeah. So come and see um, the exhibits at the McLean Textile Gallery. Mm -hmm. uh, we welcome you. Thanks, bye. Hi, this is Lauren Kingsland. I'm at the McLean Textile Gallery this afternoon, and I want to just share with you a special treat that we have for you this month. Through the window behind me, you can see a couple of the pieces from the private collection of the quilt doctor herself, Nancy Preston. She has an extensive collection of mid 20th century Ohio Amish quilts, all handmade and she has representative samples of many of their the beloved patterns that um, have been made in that community through the years. So um, through just looking through the window, this is what you can see from the hall and the beloved come to the log cabin variation. Over here we also have the um, adaptation of the beloved floral applique done on a black background with white and gray motifs. Very, very striking. Nancy has, um, here in the collection, there are a couple versions of this particular uh, style. I want to scoot over here to another piece, um, other pieces in the collection. This is, of course, the Carolina Lily, um, red and green and white, traditional color combinations. A beautiful example, very, very nicely made, hand pieced, hand quilted. And then here we have a, a cornucopia, if you will, of uh, quilts from this collection. Again, all hand pieced, all hand quilted, lovely examples of um, Ohio Amish quilts. There's the Lone Star. Really lovely red and green applique with some embroidery. 
um, another Lone Star, all in one fabric with some um, nice quilted motifs, a beautiful leaf quilting in the corner combined with a cable, and some more lovely red and green applique with some flowers on them, and yet another red and green Lone Star with a quilted motif in the corner. These are lovely examples of what's been going on in the uh, Ohio Amish community during the latter part of the 20th century. And here, finally, we also have a red and green grandmother's flower garden, all hand quilted, almost in the ditch, very close to the edge, as is so common with, the, um, with these good uh, grandmother's flower gardens in the Midwest. There are a few other pieces from this collection. In the far corner of this gallery, another Lone Star and a, um, just two more pieces from the Quilt Doctor collection here in the gallery. Um, here's a traditional um, sunbonnet sue with little hand embroidered flowers and embroidery on the hat and a navy blue and white Lone Star with yet another uh, quilted motif, kind of an interlaced hearts motif there. So all of these quilts from the Quilt Doctor's collection are um, available for sale, if you wish, and there, they'd be a lovely in addition to a, an interior. So thank you. Thank you for visiting us today here in the McLean Textile Gallery. I hope you'll come and see us in person. Thank you.